I thought I would do a little video here to show what I do to take some of these firearm photographs. I uh, thought a video might be a little bit easier to see what's going on. Uh, basic setup here. I've used several different kinds of setups. I built a light box with several lights mounted to it. Uh, I've since moved into a smaller apartment so I don't have room for all that. So my wife and I bought this, I think we paid 30 bucks for it or so on Amazon, just a small tent. has a flap that comes down over the front, which helps keep some of that light inside the box, helps get some light back onto the front of the items, fill in some of the shadows and such when you go to take the photograph. Um, have a good sturdy tripod that I use here because since they're, I'm basically, I've got this set up right now inside of a, a sunroom. Uh, overcast days are really good. There's a good even light in here on overcast days. Um, but it's still not a lot of light inside of the box. It does diffuse it and it, it makes for a nice soft light, but the exposures that I typically use inside of this light box on days like this um, are anywhere from 8 to 30 seconds. So you do want a good steady tripod or I need one to do that kind of stuff for those long exposures because I'm using a very small aperture when I do this so I can get as much of the gun and accessories and props and focus as I can. Small aperture is a small hole. It doesn't let in a lot of light, so you got to have a longer shutter speed to, to get the light in there for proper exposure. I'm also using uh, small ISO values to keep the sharpness up, keep the noise down, which also uh, it requires uh, longer exposures to get the proper exposure with that. Uh, this is a D7000 digital SLR. Uh, for most of the photos, I just used uh, the Nikon 18-105 to that came with it. Uh, if you're going to use a tripod, definitely keep your vibration reduction off because it can actually introduce vibration. If there is none, it's looking to compensate for any movements. If there is no movements, it's moving and it doesn't need to be. So uh, keep that off if you're using a tripod. Um, I do have a Tokina 100mm micro or macro lens that I'll use if I really need some close, serious close-up detailed shots. Uh, being a macro lens, it does to a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio, but for most shots, I, I don't really need that. This, this lens actually does a pretty good job of getting in close with stuff and showing some detail. But anyway, uh, this particular light box came with a couple different colors of backgrounds. Uh, red, blue, and black. Uh, the blue and black I find a little dark for a lot of black gun stuff, so I don't, I don't use them all that often. Um, it can be a cool effect, but, but I kind of like the way that the red one looks. Uh, kind of This thing kind of collects a lot of dust. Little particles show up on there. But anyway, um, just going to do a quick photo of a couple of SIG P229s I've got uh, for this example. These are... Um, <laughs> The notorious buckyballs. I don't know if, if you followed that whole debacle online, kids swallowing these things and going to the hospital and the uh, government agency came in and, and banned these little magnets. So they're, ooh, you got guns here and magnets, very, very de deadly stuff. I think the gun or the magnets are scarier than the guns even. Anyway, um, I find that these things make, uh, they're pretty convenient. It's a pretty strong magnet. Um, they're, they're just little balls, and uh, you can make different shapes and different crap with them. But um, they're, they're a pretty strong magnet, but they're not, uh, they've got a coating on them, and they're not going to scratch your, your firearms and stuff. But I find that they're kind of nice to, to use to prop the guns up and stuff. They'll kinda, they won't stick to aluminum, of course, but they'll stick to these steel slides pretty well. Um, they're, not, they're not ideal, but I don't like using things through the trigger guards to prop up the firearms because... Um, it, that stuff shows up in the photo, so it's kind of annoying to me. I don't like doing it. I do on some, but but on most of them, I like to do this kind of stuff. So, just head in here a little bit. Got to prop this guy up. And this is not a solid bar. These magnets, so so they do kind of move against each other and stuff. So it takes a little bit of finagling sometimes to to get them to do what you want them to do. But a little. Patience and persistence usually pays off in that area. Uh, set that guy there. And typically I'll toy a bit with, with the positioning and stuff on these. Um, and this guy, so you can take these things and kind of break them apart. If you don't 
kind of want to have them propped to different degrees. I'm not too concerned with with getting this photo perfect for these purposes. So got those pistols set up in there. Get our camera moved in, and um, I put the camera in manual setting for this. And to reduce vibrations, I use the self timer. Uh, this particular camera also has a, an infrared remote release that I can use. I'm, I'm too lazy to go back to the camera bag and get it. So the self timer works just as well. Um, to, to hit the shutter release, step back a few feet, let the camera do its thing because when that shutter's open for, I don't know how long this is, let's just take a quick look here and see. I'm gonna have the aperture set to 20, I think here. And to get a proper exposure, and having this down will increase your light, so you need, kind of need to have that down to see what your proper exposure is going to be. Looks like with a 20 aperture, eh, today it's kind of bright, I guess. I'm going to get away with four seconds. Uh, and that's a little bit of trial and error. Sometimes the exposure meter, you need to adjust a little bit. That's the great thing about digital photography is you can go in there and see what, it, what it's like. The film wasn't... Uh, wasn't as good for that, obviously. And we'll just kind of adjust it a little bit. I'm definitely going to have to reposition those to some degree. I'm getting what I want there. Let's do a little sample shot here. So, hit my button. It's got about a two second delay. Step back, it takes a photo. These little critters over here, sometimes I have to lock them out of this room if they're being rambunctious because they'll run back and forth, shake the floor, and with those long exposures, that's no good. But they're being really calm right now, so they'll be all right. So, we'll just take a quick look and you can see you get a pretty nice exposure there. Probably can't see it in the video, but it's definitely not the setup that I want, but that'll that'll serve for the purposes of what I'm trying to do here. Um, and I will do a little demonstration. It won't be with, with this particular photograph. I'll use a different different set of photographs, but I'll I'll do a little video recording of what's going on in Photoshop that I that I do with the photos. Just as a G whiz in case anybody cared and cared to try to emulate anything. In this video today, I'm going to be going over some of the post-processing that I do for firearm photographs. Uh, I already did a portion of the video where I showed uh, the process of actually taking the photograph, and this will kind of show what happens on the back side. Um, I use Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, and Bridge uh, to do my post-processing work. And this will primarily focus on firearm photographs, but uh, really, this applies. This, these are the same steps I take with almost any photograph I take, um, but I'm just focusing on the firearm stuff for right now because I, I really enjoy doing those. Um, I do shoot exclusively in RAW, mostly with Nikon equipment. Um, for those of you that don't know, RAW files basically, when your camera shoots in RAW, um, typically people with their digital cameras, when they take a picture, it it's a JPEG image that the camera does. Um, and when it does that JPEG, your camera is set to make decisions based in, make decisions and apply settings such as sharpness and contrast and color saturation. And you may have some control over that in the menus as to what degree the camera applies those settings to the image. With RAW though, it doesn't apply any of those settings. It, you're gonna do that later on in the process. And that's how I prefer to shoot. It just gives you more f flexibility with the photographs, and I, I think gives you a better result in the end. Um, a lot of a lot of cameras do a great job with their JPEGs, and people get great photos with it. I just I just prefer to to do a lot of that in post processing, but that's just me. Here uh, we're in Adobe Photoshop Bridge, or Adobe Bridge CS6. 
Uh, you can see I've I've got some photographs of a CZ pistol that I took. I've got an NEF file down here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go go ahead and open up the raw file that NEF, and it will open up in Adobe Camera Raw. And back in the background is Photoshop, and I've actually already opened this in Photoshop. I'm just opening it in RAW to kind of show you what happens here. So basically, this is my RAW image, and I have a lot of different options here in Camera Raw. I don't do a lot in Camera Raw, uh, just some very basic stuff. Um, white balance is a big one. Uh, I try and get correct white balance when I shoot the photo, because that's what determines like the, the overall color temperature of your photograph. Um, and you want to try and get that pretty... Uh, pretty spot on when you take the photograph uh, and I try and do that. You, you can do manual white balances and stuff with some of the SLRs or uh, most of most of your digital cameras have presets in them for like uh, uh, tungsten, daylight, shade, overcast, different things. But here you can manipulate white balance within RAW as well. Uh, if you come to this drop down menu this is, uh, you have the as shot option which is what the camera determined it should be. Um, I can do auto so I'll let camera raw decide. That's a little too blue cast for my taste. Uh, doesn't really represent the the item very well. Daylight here. A lot of the same settings that you'll actually see in your camera. Cloudy, shade, tungsten, just different things. I'm going to keep it as shot though. Um, the other thing I'll mess with in camera raw is, is here. Um, I will usually just hit the auto button because sometimes it does a really great job. And it'll just, wow, I really like that. Um, sometimes not. Like this one, I think, is a little bit too bright. It, it added a little bit too much brightness. Um, and it, it often does that. And what I'll do is, um, you can just take the exposure, just take it down a little bit uh, to whatever your taste is. But I'm going to be manipulating a little bit of that later anyway. But if I don't like what it did anyway, I can just, I can just hit it... Uh, Hit default, and it takes it back. The, the nice thing about all of this stuff that I'm going to do in Photoshop is that it's all non-destructive to the original image. You can undo anything that you've done to an image. Um, so you don't have to worry about breaking it or, or anything like that. So I've actually already um, opened this up in Photoshop, so I'm just going to cancel this. This was just to show camera raw. Um, this is the image after I had done the white balance and, and the auto exposure type stuff in camera raw that was opened. Um, I've actually already previous war previously done this photo so um, you can see over here I've got a bunch of layers which I'll talk about in a second um, that I've already applied to the photo and I've just turned them off um, and I'll show you the steps that I went through for the photo as I go through them. Uh, so this is what will happen after you get it through camera raw and open it. Um, now what I what I have is I have a default file within Photoshop, and it has all of the layers that I typically use to um, as a baseline for editing a photo and for post processing. And what layers are basically you have your photograph is a layer. It's like the bottom layer, um, and you can just think of these layers as as uh, stacks of uh, sheets of paper or something. So I've got my photograph on the bottom. And then I've got all these different layers. And you have a lot of different, they're adjustment layers. Um, like the first one here, levels. That's the brightness and the darkness uh, of your photograph that you can adjust in levels. And I'll show you that. Um, curves is a very important layer. Curves kind of adds um, that pop to your photographs. Uh, it adds contrast to it. It, it kind of um, heightens your highlights and, and it lowers your uh, darker areas and just and there, there's all different kinds of settings in, in all of these different adjustment layers and, and I'll kind of go through some samples with that. Um, hue and saturation, that's where you mess with your color, um, how much you want your color saturated wh or whether you want to desaturate it completely which I'll also show you. Uh, and then I've also got some layers here for text, uh, my little copyright layer that I have and then I have an information layer if I choose to put some information about whatever's the subject of the photograph. But I like to have this default file because I even have it to where all of my typical layers are already selected. So all I do is I come in here and I right click this whole selection and I'll just say duplicate layers and I want to send it to one of the photographs that I have open and I'll just hit OK 
and it'll pop all those layers over there. It just it it makes um, the post processing can be pretty time consuming, and this just helps kind of streamline it a little bit. I'm gonna hit cancel here because I've already copied those layers over previously. So we'll just hop over to the photograph, and you can see I've got a bunch of different layers here. You see some a layer here that's kind of weird looking. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So right now, all you can see is the background layer because I've shut off all these layers that are above it. And this is what kind of is kind of nice. You can turn the layers on and off to see the effect that they have. So I'm going to go ahead and turn all those off for now and just kind of show you the process that I go through. Now, you'll see this layer here is labeled Clone Stamp. Uh, that's an important layer. I use that quite a bit, especially in my firearms photos. Um, and I'll show you why. Basically, um, what I'll do is I'll right-click on that background layer and I'll duplicate just that layer. And I'll call it Clone Stamp or Filters or whatever it's going to be. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit here in just a moment. But um, I've already made my Clone Stamp layer. I'll go ahead and just type as I would. Uh, normally you'd hit OK, it would duplicate it. I'm going to hit Cancel because it's already there. So here's my Clone Stamp layer. Right now it's turned off. Now I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to show you where there's something different. Turn it on. Notice those yellow dots that were right here are gone. And if you look at the red background, you'll notice there were some creases in the fabric that are gone. And I'll turn that off. Pay attention right here, right here, here, and here. Turn it back on. On and off. And the clone stamp is is basically is is just it's a brush, and it will I can copy a portion of the photograph and move it over a blemish. Basically, it's kind of I don't know what you may think of as like airbrushing or something. So I'll just I'll do a quick little demonstration here as to what's going on. So I'll go ahead and turn that layer back on, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I use this often to delete serial numbers from my firearms because the nice thing about this is a lot of people just use a paintbrush or something. I don't like that because you can see it. Uh, when you clone stamp, and this is my clone stamping tool, I'm going to go ahead and click on it to select it. When you clone stamp, it doesn't look like there was ever anything there. And what I'm doing here, I hit the Alt button, and then I left click in an area. This is the area that I want to duplicate or emulate. So I'm going to click right there. And now when I release that Alt button and I move over here, it takes whatever that area was I Alt clicked and then I click there and it applies whatever was there to the new area that I click on. So I'm going to do it again, Alt click, come over here, And this is what I typically do to, to erase serial numbers on my firearms and photographs, because I don't, I don't know that it really matters, um, but then I, just, I don't like them being on there, so I, I take them off. And you can see, I mean, if you didn't know that that was there, I'll zoom back out, you, you would probably, I mean, you can kind of see that there was something there, but it, it doesn't jump out at you. And you can, and you can mess with that um, to certain degrees to make it look better. Um, you do have some options with the clone stamp with the brush size that was set to 83 pixels. Here it is set to 374. Uh, you can also set the hardness of the brush. So you can see it's got a feathered appearance. It's only at 25% hardness right now. If I take that up to 100% hardness, it's a solid circle is what it's going to do. So let's, let's just do an example here. I'm going to Alt-click right here and then I'm going to click right here and it just, you can see that circle very defined that I just clone stamped on there. I'm going to undo that because obviously I don't want that there. Uh, Command Z, I'm working on a Macintosh uh, so it's going to be a little bit different than your PCs but Command Z uh, will, will undo. You also have your history bar up here. It'll show all the different things that I've done to it and I can go and step right back up. Just like I said, all of it's non-destructive. Um, I can step right back up turn off things that I've done and you can see if you look down here as I click those you'll see the check the word check coming back as I undo all those clone stamps that I did. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and delete all those because I, I don't want to take so I'll go to the first one the one the first one that I want deleted and it will delete everything underneath of it as well. 
I'll hit delete, delete clone stamp, yes. And all of those adjustments are gone. And the nice thing, it, like if you really feel that you, all these layers, you know, you can go back in and, and change them, um, change all the settings as you wish. And you can just delete them. You just right click and delete the layer if you don't like it, um, or just turn it off like I showed you earlier. But anyway, so that's the clone stamp that I do. Uh, that's a big one, firearm stuff that I do. Um, now, as I said, the camera did not apply any sharpness settings when it took this photograph. Um, so I have to apply those. And the, th the tool that I use to do that, um, after I have, if I choose to clone stamp a, a photograph, after I do that, I will then copy, I will duplicate that clone stamp layer, and we'll call it filters. Now, I've already created the filters layer, so I'm just going to cancel that. But if I didn't clone stamp, then I will just duplicate the background layer and call it filters. But um, then what I'll do, after I have my filters layer, I'll come up to the filter menu. Whoops, sorry. I have to turn it on or else it won't work. Filters menu. And I'm going to click convert for smart filters. That allows it that allows me to go back in and manipulate my filters after the fact. And I'll kind of explain that here. Um, now, this is grayed out because I've, I've actually already done it. I have already applied the smart filters. So what, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just turn that off. We'll just go through this process real quick. I'm going to duplicate the clone stamp layer, call it filters. It's working there. OK, so here's my new filters layer. I'm going to come up to filter. I want to convert it for smart filters. And it'll chug a little bit. You'll see a little icon that'll pop up here on the, f on the uh, layer. Now what I want to do is come in here, and I want to apply an unsharp mask. And I know that sounds like it would be unsharpening it, but it actually sharpens the photo. So it'll pop up, and you, can, you have a little preview window here, and you can adjust the amount of sharpness that you want to apply. And the radius and threshold, I got these values from a photographic magazine um, that said that these were the best ones to use um, as far as the radius and threshold. Uh, the amount, depending on the photo, I, I, I use different amounts, but um, th typically I, I use, unless it doesn't work, unless what I typically use doesn't work, um, I typically use 175 for the amount and then 0.3 for radius, 0 for threshold. Um, and unless the photo needs something else, I just leave it at that. And they work well um, for my purpose. And I'm just going to call it filters again. So I've applied my sharpness here. And I'll go ahead and turn that layer back on. And, and you won't see a huge difference in it right now with it being so large and everything. Um, but you do need that layer there. Um, the next layer that I'll typically work on is the levels layer, and this is just kind of your overall light of the of the scene, your your brights and your darks, your highlights and your your shadows and such. Um, and what I can do here, you can see the histogram here. This is your uh, brightness, your highlights. I can drag that over. Oops, sorry, I didn't turn the layer on, so you can't see that adjustment that I'm making. Make sure you turn that layer on, and there you can see what was done to it. Kind of popped up there. I can increase the brightness to blinding levels. Increase those dark tones. My mid tones I can adjust. Um, now, typically, I I have taken the photo so that it's properly exposed. Um, and I may have adjusted some of that in camera raw. So typically the levels I don't get messed with a whole lot, but I may fine tune a little something there. And there are presets here. You can just you have some preset options, um, light and shadows. That doesn't look great in my opinion. Mid tones brighter. Just there's all kinds of options in Photoshop. It's just huge. There's so much stuff. Um, I'm gonna hit it to default. Um, and I'm going to add a little bit. It's a little dark, so I'm going to add a little bit of brightness there. Um, and I do typically kind of make it a little bit brighter than it needs to be initially because when I go to my curves layer, which we're going to look at next, I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And you can see it made the highlights a little brighter and the, sh the dark spots a little darker. It just adds kind of like a pop to the photo. Um, but I typically make it a little bit brighter, and then curves kind of takes it 
down a little bit in those. Otherwise, the dark spots end up being a little bit too dark, in my opinion. Um, my typical curve setting is linear contrast. I find linear contrast works really well for my taste, and all this is obviously kind of to your taste. Um, but there are lots of different options in here. Color negative. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty funky. <laughs> cross process. I do use cross process in some types of photos. Um, it, it can be interesting to mess with. I'm not going to get into details with that now, but uh, I do use that in some, not typically firearm photos, but in some other kind of photos. Um, medium contrast, a little bit darker. But I, I find the linear contrast works well for most of my photos. Um, and once again, you can turn that off. Turn it on to see the effect in force. Uh, the next thing I'll typically mess with is hue saturation. And I'll turn that layer back on. And this is increasing your color saturation, or decreasing it, depending on what you want to do. Um, typically, this once again has presets, I just like the increased saturation effect, typically. Um, and what that's doing is it t it's taking your master colors, all of your colors, and it's just increasing them by 10. So I've got my saturation slider here, I'll take it to zero. So there it is at zero. Increase it, that's to 18. And that's all the way up to 100, which is obviously not what we want. Or you can desaturate it, and there you have black and white. There's no color in it. But like I said, I typically I like the um, the increased saturation preset, but I may fine-tune that based on the photograph. Um, and you can manipulate it further from there. Say I've got that red background and that red box. For whatever reason, I, I think it's too red. I want to reduce some of my reds. Uh, so I can go to red, right now it was set to master, I can go to red, and I can just say, I want to desaturate my reds. And there you can see the reds are gone, but you can see my yellows are still there. And I can go in and, and say, I like my yellows, I want to, I want to really make those pop. So you can increase that. It's, it's all to your taste, um, just whatever you want to do. There are some more presets, I'll set this back to default for now. Um, cyanotype, we'll give it a blue hue, if if you like that. Uh, old style, kind of a desaturated type of look. Uh, sepia, I'm sure people are familiar with that brown brownish tone. Red boost is a preset, um, which I don't think we need since there's so much red in this one. So I'll go ahead and set that back to my saturation there. And. Then I'll have my um, my little copyright layer that I do. I'll turn that back on. It's just a text layer. And I can go in and open that and manipulate it in any way I want. I can type anything I want in there. I can change the font size, the font. Um, it's just a text layer. So you've got all kinds of options. The color, if I want to change the color, anything like that. And uh, I can move that around the photo, too, with my little pointer tool here. I can... If I decide I'd rather see that copyright layer up in this corner, I can do that. Um, I do have an information layer on this one. I can turn that on. And it's the exact same thing. It's just another text layer is all it is. Um, I can type whatever I want in there, whatever's going on with the photo. Now, in this particular photo, there is a, a little bit of a, a little bonus feature in there, and that is this layer. And that is actually from a separate photograph. That's just a perspective on looking the the site picture. And how I did that, I'll go ahead, I'm going to pop over to where that came from initially. That was from this photograph. And once again, I've shut off all my layers here. I'll go ahead and turn those on. I've got my sharpness layer I did. I did no clone stamp on this one. My levels, kind of brightened it a little bit. My curves, added some contrast to it. Hue saturation. Now, what you see what I did there is I actually desaturated this photo. Um, I took, I wanted only the sites to be in color because I really wanted those things to pop. I wanted them to stand out. So you'll see the whole photo is in black and white except for the fiber optic tubes on these sites. And how you do that is you'll notice there's this white box on these layers. That is your layer mask. And that tells what portion of the layer is actually going to be visible and actually take effect on the layers below it. So, with this one, 
I can show you what the actual mask looks like by hitting, pressing the Alt button and then clicking on it. And you'll notice that the whole mask is white, except for these little black areas in here where the uh, fiber optic sights are. So I'm going to go ahead and, and Alt click and go back to this. And how you do that is you, you, you select that mask and you select your paintbrush tool. And I've got black and white I can paint in. I can also paint in gray. And I'll, I'll kind of demonstrate that here in a second. But right now it's set to black. So on my hue saturation layer, I've desaturated the color. And so it's all in black and white. And where I want things to be in color and not be in black and white, I simply take the paintbrush and paint using the color black on the mask itself. I'm telling Photoshop I don't want the black and white to be in effect in this area. So, right there, I'm painting black on the mask, which is allowing, or I'm sorry, not allowing that black and white effect to take effect in that portion of the photo. You see, I'm going to paint that away. Now, I'm going to do uh, Command Z here to undo that paintbrush effect that I just did. And you can see, so you can see how that effect kind of comes to be. Um, and I can also, I don't have to simply paint in black or white on the mask. I can use the grayscale. Like, let's say I kind of want it to be in black and white on the mask. So I choose that mid-gray tone. And I paint here, and you see the color is kind of coming through. Not as much as if I had painted black on the mask, but you can see some of the color there. So I'm going to undo that. Now I actually added a second hue saturation layer. And um, this one, I've got it set to saturate, not to desaturate. The first one took it to black and white, except where I painted black on the mask. The second one is actually making those colors stand out more. I increased the saturation to plus 20, so it really makes the green and that red pop, because that's, that's what I want that to do. And I also have my copyright layer here, which is turned off. I don't need it on here. Because what I want to do with this particular photo is I want to take it and I want to overlay it on the first one. So what I do here is I right-click and I choose to flatten the image. And what it does is it takes all those layers, and that's fine. It's talking about the uh, copyright layer that I have turned off. I'm going to take all of those layers. It's going to flatten them into one layer. So it takes all those effects that I did, applies them to the background layer, and flattens it into one layer. And then I want to take it and I want to duplicate it. And I want to move it over to that other photograph. And what I'll do here, I, I name it the same name as what the the original name of this file was so I know what it was Oops. and I would hit OK I've already done that previously so I'm gonna hit cancel here because I don't actually want to do it right now so if you go over here you know what I'm gonna do that so I can show you kinda what I did there So I am gonna go ahead and copy this layer because there's some stuff over there I'm gonna show you how to do Okay, oops. Now I forgot to choose um, to move it to the other photograph, but that's fine. Um, I'll just hit that duplicate layer again, and I'll choose my other photograph. So it'll move it over there. So now when I click back over to my photo, oh, you see that that photo is now overlaid on my original one. I'm going to turn off that layer I just copied. There's my photo. Turn it back on. It's back over there. And you can see the smaller portion that I'd made before still sitting up there in the corner. And I'll show you how to do that. So what I want to do, I'm going to turn this layer back on. And I need it to be smaller than its original size. So I'm going to go up to Edit, Free Transform. Now, you can kind of see here, I'm going to, I'm going to shrink this a little bit, the overall image. There we go. So you can see this box, it's allowing me to resize it. Now I want to keep my proportions the same. So whatever my height and width are, I want them pro to proportionally be the same. Um, so if I hold Shift and I choose this corner button, I can move it in and out, and it keeps my proportions the same. If I don't hold Shift when I do that, if 
I'm not careful, see how I can squeeze the photo height-wise and such, height-wise and width. I'm going to undo that that I just did because I want to keep those uh, portions constrained. So I'll make that small, and then I can choose my, uh, yeah, go ahead and apply it. And I'll just move it up there, and you can kind of see how I did that, how I ri how I got that slide up there originally. Now, you can see I don't want that big rectangle. I don't want all of that photograph there. I only want the slide on there. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the, the previous one so I can show you what I've done. So here's my photo. I don't want this whole thing in here, though. I just want the slide. This is where I come back to my layer mask. So down here, there's a button you can click to add a layer mask because there's not one on this layer yet. So I click here to add that mask, and it's the exact same thing. White will allow that layer to show through. Black hides it. So I want to paint in black. I want to get my paintbrush up here and watch as I paint in black on that mask. The portions of that layer that I'm painting black disappear. I'm just kind of doing it real sloppy right now, just to get a general, whoops. And see, I just deleted some of that slide. Real easy to get it back. Um, X, the bu X button, will switch between your two uh, colors here, black and white, or whatever you have, if it's a grayscale. Just hit X, it selects white. So if I want to get that back, I just paint white, if I did a little bit too much. Hit X to switch to black, delete some of this, and see how I accidentally did that. So I'll go back and hit white, put it right back in there. And then to get it fine-tuned, you just zoom in. And just like with the clone stamp tool, you have brush options up here. You can choose the size of your brush and the hardness. So I'm going to make the brush a little bit smaller. So I can really get in close to the slide and just get those sections that I want. Um, I like the 25% feathered because it, it kind of it kind of blends in nicely. It's not a real sharp, um, like just for instance, let's take and move my hardness up to 100. And when I paint, there I'm painting black and you can see it's just, it's a hard, it's a circle. And if I do go back to 25%. You can see it's a feathered circle. So it's nice to have some feathering. It kind of helps blend in that, that portion of the photo. So that's how you get that smaller photo within the bigger one. And I'm going to go ahead and turn that off because that was just to demonstrate and turn back on the one that I'd already done. So that is the photograph all the things that I did to it. Now, when I want to go to save this thing, I want to put a border on it. To do that, once again I'm using a Macintosh, your PC will be different, but on a Macintosh if you hold the Alt Command and C buttons, press those all at the same time, it'll bring up a canvas size option. This is my canvas as it's sized from the file that came from the camera. I want it. There's different ways to add borders. This is, to me, is the quickest way for for the type of border that I that I like. Um, through experimentation, I know that I need to add 0.4 inches to the width and the height to get the border that I like on my photos. I could make it bigger. I could make it smaller. I just like that 0.4 for um, photos that come off my D7000 Nikon. So all I'm going to do is come in and say increase the width to 16.827 and the height to 11.280. I just added 0.4 inches to each dimension. Hit OK. And give it just a second here. You'll see that nice white border pop up there. And it has to render those smart filters. Now I'm going to undo that because there was another option there I forgot to 
forgot to show you. I'll do the Option Command C again to pull that back up. I'll do the 16.827. Oh, whoops, got my decimal point in there. 16.827, 11.280, and you can choose the extension color. Um, black, white, gray. You can choose any color that you want by opening the palette. Um, let's choose, I, let's just choose a green. I've never done a green. We'll see what happens there. Now let's do this really bright green here. So I hit OK. And let it do its work. Asking a lot of my poor old Mac here. And there we go. I've got a hideous bright green border there, kind of Christmas themed, I guess, with <laughs> red and black, or uh, red and green, I mean. I'm going to undo that with my Command Z, because I definitely do not like that. I'm going to go back in, once again, my 16.827 and 11.280, and I want my white back. I like that border. Once again, we'll have to wait here for just a second as Photoshop applies that. Alright, and there's my border. Oh, and at any point in this process, uh, actually, very often in this process, you should be saving your files. Um, uh, Command S on the Mac will save it, or you can go up to File here and choose Save. It will save it. I choose to save them as Photoshop Documents.psd. That saves all my layers and everything. Um, they're huge files. hundreds. They can be hundreds of megabytes, depending on what you did to the photo. But I can always open that back up, that PSD file later, and I can change any of these layers. I can do anything that I want, all non-destructive. Um, so I save it as a PSD. Until I'm ready, until the photo is finished, um, and I want to have it as a JPEG, so I can share it online or put it on my phone or do email it, do whatever I want to do with it. Um, I'll still have that .psd file, but I typically and I can just save this as a JPEG right now if I want to, because it's a you know it's a nice sharp photo. I can just come up, I do save as. It'll take just a second for it to open. Here it is. It's a .psd right now. I'd already saved it as such. Um, format here is just Photoshop. That'll be the .psd. I want to save it as a JPEG. And you have all these different options for saving it. But I want to save it as a JPEG. If I hit Save, it goes through the merging of all the layers because it has to flatten all that stuff down. And I have options for the quality of the JPEG I want to do. I typically keep it at 8, um, just to make the file size a little bit smaller. That's for sharing stuff online. Now, when you do that, it it does affect the quality of the photo a little bit. It kind of adds more sharpness than I like and such. But it, for sharing online, I'm fine with it. If I were going to pr be printing these photos or anything, I, I would save them to a higher quality. I'd probably even save them as a TIFF or something. Um, other than a JPEG, but the the eight quality it it's fine for sharing online and such. And in fact, before saving as a JPEG, I'll actually go through and reduce. I just hit Option Command I on the Mac, and I want to reduce it on the longest side. This is my personal preference, and some websites, uh, forums, and stuff restrict you to a 1024 on your longest side uh, pixels, 1000 or 1024 pixels. So I'll change in this in this instance on this photograph the width is the longer dimension. So I'll change that to 1024 and hit OK. And this also helps reduce the size of the file and keeps those images from being huge when when you're scrolling through on the forum. Um, if you don't reduce that size and and you keep it to that native 5300 or whatever it was, I mean it it's huge and you have to like scroll around in the browser to even see the whole photo can be kind of obnoxious. So there it, it brought that down and then I go through my same process to save it. Um, Command Shift S is the shortcut on Mac to do that. And I can go through and I can save that as a JPEG with the same options. And I'm not going to actually do that right now. 
And if I hop over to Adobe Bridge, where this file is saved, you can kind of see I can go progressively through all these little changes that I made. So, for instance, the slide here, this is the original NEF file off the camera. Here's my .psd file saved with all the layers. I can open that anytime and adjust any of those layers, do anything I want. Uh, and I didn't save this one as a JPEG because that wasn't my goal with it. I wanted to overlay it on the other photo, which we'll go over to. Here's the file, the .nef .nef file out of the Nikon camera for that one. Here is my .psd file, and you can see that other photograph's uh, slide is right here. And here it is saved as that JPEG. This has been reduced to 1024, and you can actually see it in my file names. Um, I'll tell what pixel I reduced it to, and then the quality that I used on the JPEG, which was an 8. Um, I also do, I will also save it um, without the copyright information. I, I put these photos on the firing line uh, contest every month. Just, just different stuff. It's kind of fun to just put stuff up and see what other people are doing. Um, but they don't want any writing on those photos. It's in the rules, so I, I delete the copyright on there for that. Um, and any information. On this particular one, I also took the slide out of there just because it's a uh, uh, little bit too photoshopped um, for, for what I, I like to do on there. But uh, so that's, I mean, that's the process uh, for, for what I use for most of my photographs. Um, it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of work. It's very time consuming. Um, but I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy photographing these guns almost as much as shooting them. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but like I said, it, it's a labor of love, so <laughs> it, it does take a lot of time. But uh, I hope you found some of this information informative. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, leave a comment here or uh, 